checking that I know where the fire escapes are before I tell you where they are, but it's slightly self-evident. The thing you might have trouble with is that you run away from the fire in the direction of the exit. There is a fire. Okay? Mobile phones off. No talking, no eating, all that kind of stuff. So, it's a huge pleasure, uh, as ever, um, to, to welcome Dali Wall Basley. Um, he probably needs uh, little or no introduction. Um, Dali Wall is emeritus uh, professor at the University of Cambridge. He's now currently a fellow at Emmanuel College. Um, he's, without doubt, one of the preeminent um, thinkers in our field of our time. Uh, that sounds very grandiose, but it's true. And there are a few people um, who wouldn't agree with the kind of substance and depth um, of Dali Boer's thinking of one of the four, four forefronts of really um, establishing um, a counterpoint to the kind of willful domination of kind of technical and formal thinking that, that is prevalent in our, in our field today, um, in linking architecture, philosophy, and in particular the area of phenomenology um, in, 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 in current, the current debate. And many of the world's uh, uh, leading architects and critical thinkers, educators, that uh, are a great debt to the 30 or 40 years that Dali was spent um, in both uh, design and, and architectural education. Um, we're um, hugely proud to have this association with the school. And without further ado, let me welcome Dali Wall this evening. It's not terribly important. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. I can, I can, I can do it. No, no, no. You can put it sort of half, half, half. Don't stop it now. Just about time. The question is always to see pictures and you can... Can you hear me in the back? Everybody? Thank you. The situation we are in, is one of the things, well, I'm not one of the things, but that's what I would like to address. Um, mostly we feel uneasy. We feel that there is very little orientation, everybody to himself, herself, and uh, we sort of living in a highly sort of fragmented world. And yet, and yet, at the same time, we seem to be sharing the same world. On what level? Big question mark. There's no doubt that apart from this fragmentation, we definitely are much aware of the fact that um, you cannot escape sharing. Uh, you cannot possibly say that uh, there are people who don't belong to mankind. You cannot say that human rights would sort of stop somewhere and don't apply to the rest, and so on. And yet, this paradox, and it is a paradox, isn't it? That on one side, we hardly find agreement between two or three people. Everybody's got his own vision of things and taste, as we call it. So, fragments on one side, and strange kind of unity on the other, which we cannot avoid. In fact, we cannot avoid one or the rest either, we just somewhere in the middle. And that's exactly where I'm speaking from, you know, the position in the middle. Why is it that it is like that? What made it happen? And how can we get out of it, if we can get out of it at all? Because I'm an optimist, I still believe that we can. Now, what is happening on the scene is, um, again and again, a discrepancy, not between the fragments and the unity, potential unity, but also vertically between uh, what is expected and what we really would like to do. Uh, it's almost in architecture now, and it's strange, isn't it? Like in the rest of developments, of science, particularly, the laboratory people, and you know, you go to Cambridge, 
three quarter of people in Cambridge are working in one kind of laboratory or another. As you cross the threshold of the laboratory, you leave behind your normal life. Your friends, your family, your feelings, your intentions, blah, 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 as far as the outside laboratory world is concerned. You take in only the stuff and thinking and intention that apply to the laboratory. Well, something of that sort, sort is happening in, in our well as well. If you're working in an office, you have one idea how it should be done, especially when you're fresh. And then you discover that there are planners, there are specifications, there are pressures, political and financial, and so on and so on. And they say, no, 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 you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that because it's too expensive and because, etc. You know, that you can't do that is so notorious that it drives them nuts occasionally. Okay. Unless you get used to it. Most people simply do give up and say, well, you know, it is what it is. These are the expectations. There are specialists then on practically everything you touch, which is pretty boring you know, as well. Especially when you do large operations, high rise particularly. There are experts on the best possible layout on a tower, commercial tower. There are experts on uh, on uh, the skin of the buildings. There are experts, you can go on and on and on. And they always sort of look at you like a complete idiot and say, well, you can't do that. You know, there's a, this way and that way how you can be you know, done. And it has been experienced and experimented with and so forth. That's how we do high rise buildings. You can see particularly when it comes to the hot spot like New York. The reason that Daniel Ibeski didn't get his ground zero was very much, you can't do that. Well, you can't do that because you don't meet the same uh, criteria or parameters in terms of volumes, commercial space, and money, and so on and so forth. Plus, 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 probably the most important thing of all was the <coughs> mafia of New York, and it is in a way almost a mafia in the architecture world, people, offices, they have pri prime, sort of priority. They are the experts on the high-rise building, and they would do it. Uh, well, shall I mention names? Probably not. Um, that's why I'm one of them. And they simply feel that everybody else is just simply not up to it. You know, they are New York fellows. They didn't want so many high-rise. They do it. Expectations. So, on the vertical level, so you have two kinds of uh, dichotomies. On the vertical level, what is expected and what is at stake. The truth is that we're discovering more and more as we go that what should be done is on the other side of what is expected. And that's where intelligent architects and offices try to struggle and build some kind of a, a road or journey or bridge towards what is most important, because the critical thing as it happens, and there's many reasons for that, many reasons why it is, as it is, uh, why the expectations don't, what is expected, the official mainstream, uh, how things to be done, are usually missing, unfortunately, the level of uh, issues that are absolutely crucial and relevant to architecture. To give you just one example, there is a, uh, the boss, still is there, but it was new, development on the Thames estuary, uh, new development was supposed to be very progressive, future-oriented, and looking towards something new and better, called Thames Meat. The Thames Meat, in a few years' time, became a disaster, criminality grew up, fragment, and so on. So, at some point, they tried to save it. So what they did, they invited people that would be able to help to save it, not architects, they don't do damage, but, but they invited people that would be able to tell them what's wrong with it in terms of use, how people would respond. So, sociology comes in, psychology comes into it, and so on. Eventually, probably even touch on psychiatry. So all this extra knowledge was trying to bring it down to something which would be plausible, livable, valuable, etc. Well, you look at it and say, very, ask a very simple question. Why it wasn't done in the first place? You build the thing, you're missing the point, and then you're repairing it. It costs twice as much, or three times as much, it's late, and it cannot be done probably as well as it would have been done 
if it was in the first place. So, small illustrations. I'm going straight into images to illustrate a few points. What are the few points? The few points are not the three, as usual. Uh, three stages of development of architectural thinking, which is something we don't really pay much attention to. How architecture was done up to a certain point, how it was done then, the next stage, and how it's done in the modern times, say from 19th century, including our own time. Three stages. The one which would take into consideration the natural <coughs> conditions, build up history from it, and build up thinking out of it. Gradually, gradually, that has been transformed, and history comes in its way. So the mainstream is reference to history, origins, blah, 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 primitive half is, you know, that sort of stuff. And eventually, in the last stage, even that goes down the drain, and history disappears from the scene, and it's replaced by theory, theoretical thinking. And that's exactly where we are. That's nothing but outline of what we're going to do as we come to the last set of my talk. At the beginning, I would start really from typical illustrations of the dichotomy. The mainstream, what is expected, and what is done. Um, it's interesting that you probably know, before I go into this example, you probably know the picture, because it's been reproduced so many times, of Miss van der Rohe, high rise, the beautiful uh, glass, glass tower block. That was drunk about three times. The first version of it is not published anymore. It's in archives. Gropius, who was in charge of the publications of the Bauhaus, uh, modern architecture book, said that's okay, but it's not enough modern, it's not up to date. So, Mies eventually ended up with second and potentially final third version, that's the one we know from publications, and it's completely transparent glass block, and you hardly see the structure inside, it's all very much just like um, crystal, transparent, clear affair. Expectations against reality. So that was what he expected. So Gropius was speaking in terms of what is expected. You can't do that. But you have to move into the main see what is expected. That's exactly what it was like in, for instance, what you hear. Yeah. The generation of constructivists, early 20s, the dream was to follow as closely as possible the most advanced knowledge of engineering at that point. And the engineering was sort of um, ideal vision on the horizon. So the mainstream was very much dictated. As close to engineering, the better. The guy, uh, the architect behind that, is probably known to you by name, called Leonido. By the way, great guru of, uh, of um, people like, uh, like um, Zaha and uh, the whole crew around Ion Zengelis, and Kulhas in particular. Rem actually at AI wrote monograph which he never finished on Leonido. So that you know brings it up to date a bit. But Leonido was definitely very intent and very intelligent and imaginative architect. He produced a project for a competition, the headquarters of heavy industry in Moscow, next to Red Square actually. That's what it is. That was the submission project. He didn't, you know, he did some prize, he got some prize, but he wrote, the whole thing wasn't built anyway. And uh, then, 1929, 30, as you probably know, the avant-garde was down to drain, Stalin comes on the scene, and all these people either go to Siberia or underground. They were need to succeeded to go just underground, living on interior designs, gardens, bit of furniture, these are state set. And he also decided to redraw or repaint, rather, his project, the original competition projects, which looks like that. Interesting, isn't it? So here it is, as he would like to see, as he felt about it, what the whole problem was about. Close to the center of Moscow, the old Orthodox church, tradition, churches, St. Vasily on the square and so on. He brings it to the point where, in fact, he goes even further. He takes it from the historical tradition and the church and the religion and the Russian culture <coughs> to the point that he meets it with cosmic reference to the sun. By the way, at that time, he was a privately 
illustrates a utopian vision of the future possible city, a text from around 1600 by Italian called Campanella, a Città del Sole, the city of the sun. So the sun is one of the sort of reference to something which has more than one meaning, it, you know, refers to the natural condition of the overall cosmos, but it also refers to traditions, refers to how the sun it is responsible for life, creativity, history, tradition, etc., etc., etc. He goes even further, and I'm finishing just with one more illustration. That's almost like a dream, that's almost like a dream vision. The sky dominates, the sun is now eventually, as it were, embodied in the dome of the church, the church comes down to earth, etc., etc. It can go on for quite a bit. So that illustrates, you may call it schizophrenia, you put it together, you know, the official interpretation drawings, and then the drawing which he would do if he was free of all the external pressures. The reference to the ground, those splits that we're talking about, this sort of potential schizophrenia, there's much more to it than it appears on the surface. What it appears to is that most of the expectations are results of representation, how we represent, and the power of representation, the power of representation decides very much gradually, gradually, what becomes this kind of dominating image. And you can see it even in the current, on the current scene as waves. There is a period of archigram, everybody is living directly and directly archigram. There is a return to postmodern. Most people, quite a lot of people do postmodern, whatever that means or whatever it looks like. Um, then there is a period of uh, virtual reality, playing with simultaneity, sorry, simulations, playing with possibilities that comes out of investigations known as para metrics, you know that stuff, and so on and so on. And those are waves. And for some reason, everybody, not everybody, but so many people, too many, one too many, doing it across the board, from Europe to America, Yale, Princeton, Harvard, you name it. So, they all do it, they all do it. So the dominating trend is there, but, 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 on the other side is the reference to what is given. And what is given is something which you cannot negotiate. You find it difficult to negotiate the construct if you just take part in it or ignore it. But on the other side of the spectrum, and vertically down. We're dealing with something which is given. This is a territory that I can only outline and touch on because it takes us hours and days to go properly through. But you would understand if I say that ultimately it is all that is given beyond our control, that is given to us as the inevitable natural condition, in brackets cosmic conditions, you want to call it that. Natural conditions. The natural conditions are primarily determining as if are from underneath, deep underneath, all that we do. They are deciding or conditioning, as a condition, uh, the program that we're doing. You know, if you're doing library, there is that much you can cheat and do with libraries, but eventually there is something to do with reading, and reading is to do with concentration, there is to do with people's sort of sitting or standing or reading or studying, uh, the chairs, the panic chair, the interior, the light, you can go on and on and on. They are relatively very surprisingly stable situations. And they are <coughs> stable because they are related to something which is deeply repetitive. It is a cycle of cycles in plural, and it has a certain regularity, the regularity, the regularity. Reading in China as a process is not that different from reading in Paris. You know, people sit, they don't sort of suspend themselves from the ceiling. They sit on chairs and there is a furniture and books in front. The domination of the book, just to finish with that example, the permanent presence, the inevitable or the impossible elimination of books and book as a phenomenon, illustrates very much my point as well. Why book is still not easy to, cannot be completely replaced. It can be partially replaced improved and I, I don't know what, but it still remains, it still remains something that beyond a certain point 
to vote is vote, it cannot be, and it's still easier to use it for many reasons and for many purposes than uh, moving through the screens of the computer without any devices to use. Anyway, so enough, enough. The ultimate reference, and that's really what contemporary thinking is slowly, slowly discovering. The ultimate reference is to the natural given condition. There is a ultimate reference in the natural condition, which is our Earth. We are Earth bound. Everything is eventually coming down to Earth. And it is from that, just like gravity penetrates our whole country, that even our thinking is determined by gravity. You have to think about it. It's not straightforward, and I know that you are slightly puzzled by what I'm saying, but the more you think about it, the more you come to the similar conclusion. So the Earth as a reference is something quite, quite inevitable and quite tricky for us, because it cannot be negotiated, it cannot be changed. You can change the gravity after a certain point, but then you come back to it, it comes through the back door. So people try a lot of things, you know, moving away from the ground, you know, you start with BLOT and then you suspend buildings and you change the whole reference to the tectonics of buildings and you start working with diagonals and whatever, whatever. You can go on and on, but there is a limit beyond that. You still, in fact, even those escape routes or escape trends are measured by the reference to what it is like when you refer to the ground. So appreciating diagonal is only possible because there is a, such a thing as vertical. Otherwise, the diagonal would be totally you have an arbitrary, why not, and why yes. So, very good example, very quickly just, comes out of experiment of certain kind that bring out what we're not fully aware of. It is, as it were, deep inside our reality. And only under certain conditions, when you challenge it, when you kick it, as it were, suddenly it comes to the surface, we are aware of it. One such a thing is what I'm illustrating here. It cannot be fully illustrated, of course, but in that division, there is a possibility of inverting vision 180 degrees. You can bring uh, your sight, your vision, your visual field into that inversion by glasses, big glasses that turn everything upside down. And the interesting thing about that is that the first experience is pretty, pretty unpleasant. Because what is right, you see on the left, and by the right, but also this is upside down. So everything is reverse. Everything that you see, but not the rest of the experience. The moment you hear, the things that you touch, the whole rest of your experiences are as they used to be. So there is a dichotomy conflict. The whole operation takes about seven days to gradually, gradually, gradually reduce, eliminate the conflict. And the conflict, to give you an example, can look very short is that second or third day, you go in the morning, because you still keep it on, you go and wash your hands, and you put your, you know, the tap, the water comes out, and you see it in a particular direction. Then you put your hands on to wash, and it just goes in the wrong direction. There is one very interesting moment in it that um, tells us what is really happening, and you know, why it takes so much, so many days. <coughs> if you drop a book on the ground, you see it, there, now the book in fact is on the other side. Before you touch it, before you go for it, if you tap with your foot on the ground several times, just touch the ground, suddenly the vision and the tactile coincides and you see it in the right place. So the reference to the ground here, to the earth, is playing its very critical role. In the end, I'll cut on the show, it takes seven days, and end of the seven days, practically everybody who goes through that experiment, comes to the point where it's all fine. There's no conflict. It's all a concern. Which means your valve has been turned upside down, but it's okay. Which throws down the window and down the drain all the talks about reversed image on your retina and all that stuff. It just doesn't matter. The body can adapt to anything, as long as there is a continuity of reference. So the reference to the ground, and there is an even better example if you can use your imagination, which I see then you watch a ball game, tennis, or any kind of ball game, including football. This complexity of movements that go through, and you intuitively try the ball, <coughs> kick it a particular direction. It goes down, somebody is running there, everything is moving, everything is moving. 
And yet, in that movement, an apparent chaos, there is a precision that goes almost down to many meters. Because there's a continuity of reference from all this relationship between people on one side, other side, and between you eventually, that you play your own role in it, down to the point where you're running on the ground and you're touching the ground. The ground is the point of reference that helps you to support, like gravity, all the experiences that eventually would have a, what shall we call it, order, coherence, meaning, relevance, all that. Right. Another example, very, very quickly. Well, how all that is taking place is sort of interesting when you see it in terms of sequences. Uh, we refer to the ground and how the ground influences the other levels of our experience. It's possible to see in terms of relationship between physiognomy that we recognize things, we recognize people's faces and images and photographs. Now, if you turn your photograph upside down and show it to somebody and tell them, you know, this is John, you can't believe that because you don't see it as physiognomy. You see it as distorted, you know, upside down vision. When you see yourself in upside down, you're not terribly happy about it. It looks funny. And yet, there is a particular angle as you turn it that suddenly clicks and you recognize the physiognomy. So what does it mean? It means that physiognomy depends, depends on orientation. Without orientation, the physiognomy goes into pieces. Okay. That's not the end of the story, because orientation itself still depends on something else, depends on topography. If you don't have this overall topography, that's the football pitch. You must have that topography, which you also see. That's part of your ground, as it were, or background, including the earth. And all of that is somewhere at the back of your mind. And then from then, the basic topography, you go to orientation, and from orientation, you go to physiognomy. Now, then already about 16, the artist in 16th century already discovered and began to play this. This is one illustration. Now, what it is? Well, we're looking at a bit of a landscape, a bit of a lake somewhere, some trees, and ruins of maybe city or something. Now, what we're really looking at is that, and this 90 degrees, turns about really into some very different world, isn't it? You may think whatever you like, but you cannot deny, I think we all agree, that these two are quite different. And they're different only in orientation. The orientation changes the physiognomy quite dramatically. Okay, next one. And that's a very interesting one. This comes out of zero gravity. You say, well, if you don't have gravity, what about orientation? And what about physiognomy? Well, it shows. It shows, it shows. It's present there, not as gravity, because the gravity is non is gone, but it's there, built into our beings, into our existence, into our humanity as it were, our memory, our you know, personal history. That so we are equipped with that. So deep orientation we can, as it were, remember as well. Up to a point, up to a point. It's interesting that the astronauts uh, we're looking at the space lab. Uh, by the way, I'm going to talk about that later, touch it just. Why is it that the Russian call those characters cosmonauts and the Americans astronauts? Are they the same people or does it mean anything? Well, I'll touch on it, showing that it probably does actually. So, those guys are honest and in their diaries. Remember, they are not philosophers, they are not sort of psychology, psychiatrists, doctors, they occasionally doctor, but <coughs> most of them are physicists, scientists. And their diary are quite amazing. They all agree on one thing, that the mediating module, the one in the middle, uh, is 360 degree oriented. They hate that. They just hate that. But they talk about things that, you know, they don't like this, everything is sort of related, you know, indirectly or indifferently related. They would like to have eventually what you know clear distinction between what is up and what is down in order to be happy. And that's what comes out of it when it comes to pause between the American experiments and they eat. They have a particular culture when they do just things like you know, showers and eat. The living for it, unquote. What is interesting about that is that in the zero gravity you can 
put yourself in any kind of position. The most comfortable would be just let yourself go, end up, there's a zero gravity puts you on somewhere on the wall, somewhere on the ceiling, and you're there. And the zero gravity, you know, the balance of that situation would keep you there and you'd be fine. But you are probably in a crazy kind of position with some other people. They don't want that. They want to eat, looking each other into face, and on a table like at home, they want to have it like that. For which you have to struggle, because in order to keep yourself in that position, and of course, you can see what it is. When they can be upside down, they can be anything, but you know, they go for this. You have to fix yourself. There is a floor and the ceiling has a grid, triangular, and on your shoes you have a triangular you know, metal piece, and you have to put it in and lock yourself in. If you don't do that, anything you touch makes you fly. So you have to be careful. So with all the effort, they could have to put all this effort into it. And in order to end up like that and eat like food and what human beings, the way they are used to it. It's also interesting that in that space lab, they have probably even today still, they have one big window, otherwise it's all closed up. And that window, they can, uh, in an interval, they have an interval of hour or something, and they can do whatever they feel at that time. They all prefer to have their piece of chocolate, whatever they get in the next time, and sit next to the window and watch the earth. Little detail, mm -hmm. interesting. But the most interesting is what happens when there is a kind of unusual situation. They let be sleep, so they sleep, you know, five, six hours, whatever they have, and then uh, they also uh, keep completely without intervention at that time, so no problem. But there is an emergency and the telephone comes out. And one of the characters is writing in his diary a description of what's going on, and that's very, very interesting. He says, I'm hearing the telephone in the darkness. I can hear it, and no idea which direction to put my hand to pick it up. No idea, no orientation. So, what I'm doing is trying to find out moving my hands into any possible direction around me. And I'm touching everything, probably even, probably even the telephone, what's happening? Some ghost. <laughs> um, probably even the telephone. But I've got a clue, I don't know, when I'm touching the telephone, that it is a telephone. Because I cannot, and that's exactly the point I'm making. He says, because I cannot recognize its shape. And I cannot recognize the shape because I don't know which direction I'm oriented to. Try with closed eye, go to a horse or a cow and touch it from underneath. And you don't know which way the animal stands or sits or lies or whatever. I'm sure you must have come across it to the table from underneath. Really bizarre experience. If you don't know that you're standing and you're in the horizon, you say, so. What it says clearly is that without orientation, there is no physiognomy. And of course, the third stage, without orientation, so the orientation is not there without topography. And the topography is also, again, what you remember. You have permanent memory of what is up and what is down. And you're reading it vis-a-vis your setting environment. In other words, this particular setting is in your memory, but you can read the same setting that way because you're picking up the same elements and you can transform it in your imagination because your memory allows you to do that. Okay. Now you can obviously bring everything down to that sort of level and everything is part of your vision just by virtual, virtual simulation, simulated vision. The problem with the simulation, of course, is that um, everything depends on memory. So in that sort of stage, everything is reduced just to memory without reference. In the spaceship, the space, space lab, we still had a reference to the surroundings. You feel very situated. So you could read it, you can transform it, you can use your imagination, and the memory of this imagination will bring you to a possible orientation. That's not available here. And that's why suddenly this freedom, which is of course incredibly disputable and problematic and one-dimensional, People would, the virtual people, I thought, would describe as being more real 
than reality itself. Virtual reality, we say, to be more real than reality itself. Well, can you get food in virtual reality? Can you eat it? Can you taste it? Well, try it. Now, the interesting thing is that we come into a room doing a circle, where we are now, we're going through circle and end up at this position. That really is introducing our time. The memory, what is available in modern times from, say, late 19th century until today, is a memory. We don't have direct access to natural conditions. We don't have access to history. And we have only theoretical position, position which depends on our imagination. And imagination, eventually, the ground of it, is memory. All we have is memory and will. That's our equipment as architects. If you are in an office, Chipperfield, Eric Parry, uh, David, David Derny, all these big architects are uh, working with memory. And because their memory is good, the results are occasionally interesting. But most people don't have a very good memory. So we have left behind the natural condition. We don't need them. We left behind history. You probably know that very recently this was repeated again. People talk about post-history. We don't need history. When <coughs> there was an illustration when Gropius arrived, left Europe, and arrived to Harvard <coughs> in 1939 or 40, became head of the school, the GSD, the GSD School of Design, Harvard. The first thing he did abolished causes in history. We don't need history. We can work now from zero. Even Corbusier, but he was cheating. God was much more clever than that. He says, tout se commence à zero. Everything has to start from zero. No. His library was more than zero. And his interest, right down to the point, through history to natural condition, he spent dozens and dozens and dozens of sheets of drawings just investigating what the sun is doing with the landscape, how the sea horizon comes to archipelago, and so on and so on. However, however, we are with the memory and 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 will in a position that from right in 1900, fully 1900, around Arnuvo period, the notion has been through representation, the possibility of representation, and we see in many what it looks like such representation. This representation can create a feeling, belief, faith, dogma, that in fact, you don't need to look at history because you remember it. And your education, your reading at home and whatever, will substitute. So you're building on memory, memory, memory. Uh, and so it is with nature. You're looking at natural phenomena, landscapes and so on. And it all is feeding your memory. So you have it there. You come to the office, you sit down, and you can work from your own, as it were, emancipated resources. That's very well. Okay. So, as it happens, the creative, creative principles of the 20th century are very much structured and tuned around memory and will. If we had time, we could look at it more closely and bring in somebody like uh, with Nietzsche, Nietzsche, his commitment to art as will to power, and so on. But we have to leave it for some other occasion. The mainstream of the argument follows further from the, into principles that are very much to do with understanding the ultimate principles behind history and in the depths of nature itself, which are the ultimate creative forces of the world down to the bottom of nature, that they believe they have access to. And they saw it in the phenomenon of crystallization and crystal. It's amazing. You find it probably, if you didn't come across it before, as a bit strange and a bit uh, sort of uh, out of place. But the more you look at it, the more you get the material. And what people say, people themselves, architects of the early 20th century, it's amazing. The crystal is just simply everywhere, almost everywhere. And uh, so um, the 
Bristol is fascinating because it represents the most elementary process of creation. It appears to be. The unorganic world, the mineral, creating geometry, that's culture, isn't it? Is there anything more elementary? No, probably not. We don't know. So that's really what is the source of fascination. Now, this is a big drawing. It's a painting, actually. About 30 to about, about 10, really big piece. By an Austrian architect, not a very important name, called Habrik. And it's a project he did many of those. This one is called Chateau in the Lane. So he's an architect, he was an architect. It's a project for a building. That goes into many, many examples. And that would be typical, typical obsession this crystal in painting, that Paul Cerisier, who was a disciple and friend of Gauguin, and it's called crystal or, or temple, rather, or wisdom. So they really saw crystal in quite, quite good. Now we come to territories where we would not expect it. Too sophisticated to be just so elementary as something like crystal. And that's where I would like to, where I would like to. I think I go. Tell you what, I'm doing it because of light. Forget about that. No, not see it otherwise. This is a statement about crystal and its role in the 20th century creativity. It comes out of the pair, hand or pen of closest, one of the closest collaborators of Corbusier. His name is Posantin. He was a painter, but he was very much involved, helping, and probably in charge almost, with Corbusier of the most influential magazine called L'Esprit Nouveau, really the manifesto of modern architecture right? coming from France. Now, his quote, I have to go through the whole thing, what he says, just listen to, he is a modernist, he comes out of cubism, he goes into purism, manifesto of purism, is called Bizier. You would expect him to be very much on the side of sophisticated French, post-classical, post bizarre post uh, way of thinking. No, he tells you something else. Say, yes, it's all true. I'm French and I'm Cartesian and all the rest. So Valéry is my friend. But I tell you about the truth of the 20th century now. And he says the following. He says, <clears throat> on the whole, and in spite of personal view, one can detect a uh, tendency which might be described metaphorically as a tendency towards the crystal. The crystal in nature is one of the phenomena that touch us most because it clearly exemplifies its movement, the movement towards geometrical organization. Nature sometimes reveals to us how its forms are built by the interplay of internal and external forces. <coughs> the crystal grows and stops growing in accordance with the theoretical forms of geometry. Man uh, takes uh, delight in these forms because he finds in them what seems to be a confirmation for his abstract geometrical concepts. So, you know, we as people can use geometry because he probably invented it, but look at the nature. That's what it theoretically is. And as you come close to it, you come into terms with the ultimate, ultimate source of reality as such and creativity as such. If you appropriate that, you become a genius. Brilliant. So, now, So they all kind of perceptible to the human senses that um, confirms those laws which um, <coughs> human reason loves to profound in order to explain nature in genuine cubism. That is sometimes organic. So he referred obviously to the cubist mostly painting at the time, Brad Picasso, Juan Greek, those people. And, um, uh, proceeds outwards from 
from, from within. The organic aspect of cubism points to a domain of primary creativity. So he's using the terms, not by intention, by invention. As it is manifested in the anonymous creative processes of nature and in the conscious creativity of a genius, in the romantic understanding later taken up by the cubist and expressionist, the creativity which brought forth independent and organically evolved works was given to the artist by great creative nature, the productive force of originating spirit as the center of uh, love. So it goes, so it goes. So that really, very would not expect it. We don't need to, because time is against us, but we can find similar things quoted in Syrahism. Breton is entirely hooked on it. He refers to Christos, and I may have a few image of it to show you. He uses the crystal configuration in one of his writings and refers to it as being the key to the mystery of creativity. Fair enough. Now, if you're looking at Toronto, Danny Liebeskind is referring to it and says, uh, when I was presenting, he says, I'm just quoting, he says, uh, when I was presenting this scheme to the committee in Toronto for the museum, I told them that my inspiration and their museum is going to be a product of crystallization. It's going to be like crystal. It is from that time that I in fact referred to that building as the crystal. I asked you for a thought. He said, I, I, I sort of would sort of ask you to think. Is not architecture, in fact, it's a, in a, a process of crystallization? Question mark. Well, it's up to you to find the answer to it. Ah, I have a quotation here. Interesting. So we can read it. Crystal is the most perfect forms and their shapes frequently appear in my buildings. Let me leave you with this so All architecture is crystalline. Architecture like crystal consists of solid geometry. Well, if I'm going to an argument, I would say definitely not. Architecture is not about geometry. In the first place, it's about light and luminosity of space. And then it comes into geometry as a scaffold. So that's where we are with Libeskind. This is the Breton example of the crystals. Incomprehensible in itself. So, you know, how on earth suddenly with this complexity of psychoanalysis and unconscious associations and metaphoricity of vision, he goes to crystal. Well, because of the fascination with the creativity which is behind. Now, very quickly, natural conditions. I'm going through two stages. It's going to be one hour and 20 minutes. Is that okay? We are close. But we started late, actually. <coughs> I'm just checking. Time. When you feel tired, let me know. Um, natural condition. How it was in the stage of architecture, which goes up to 17th century. Architecture is practically different. Architecture takes place, is developed, is sorted out, it's argued, it's in manifestos, it's in treatises, etc. And in the reality of the building that come out, up to 17th century, probably beginning of 18th century, is formed in the framework of cosmology. It's formed in reference, ultimately, to the natural conditions. Now, example. Let's go back to 2000 BC. We are in the Crete, the island, and we are in near Heraklion, and there is a cave there, with looks in plan and section like that. And what you see actually is star time. That was something which fascinated them. The stalactite is, you know, the kind of thing that grows from the ceiling and meets stalagmite. So they come together and create a pillar. And one of the pillars they discovered, the archaeologist, is surrounded by a little wall, 60 centimeters high, and all the offerings are inside the enclosure, like a tenemos it's called. And the pillar is slightly shaped, slightly helped to look like human figure, like a deity. And that's it. Now, what is interesting about that is, why it was so fascinating. Why? The pillar brings together two things. Brings together the height, the ceiling, with the floor. The heaven with the earth. That was one of the real primary, primary concern of the ancient civilizations. We know that from so many examples. Just to give you one example. To stay on Crete. 
great palaces. You know, we are somewhere around 2400 BC until about 1800 BC, when all the palaces complete. Knossos, Thespos, Maria, Tosakra, and the The main palace is about five or six of them. And they are far away from each other. You can't see from each other those mountains. And they have all of them, the same sort of similar arrangement. A big rectangular court in the middle. The series of magazines, rooms, sanctuaries, and so on. But this court is precisely oriented, all of them exactly down to one degree, the same orientation. Well, you know, how, how can you do that? Well, the only way to do it is just looking at the sky. And what you see there, the regularity, is now projected down. And you do it in each case, in relation to the same configuration on the sky. End of conversation. Fine. So it means that what is about is the source, and it's a one half of the reference. This is a reference to that. The order of what is here is visible there, but the reality eventually is down on Earth. That's how architecture will be treated on the cosmic. Uh, very quickly further. That's what it would be like, you know, when it comes to a little seals, and they are very rich. The deity, they had deity, it was lady, because it was a matrimonial system anyway, is the deity, and she gives a stick, which is something to do with, you know, the rights or the power of the, of the to the, we don't know if it's a king, probably, something of that sort, of the island. Now look at that. The columns are very unique. And the columns come to existence out of the primary, primary human reality and experience that there is a problem of mediating between there and there. How do you mediate? The columns are the tree. It has a head, like a sky, it has a foot, base, and then it's a body, just like human body. This is from my scene, you are somewhere 15, 1600 BC. And look at that. So the human body and the column becomes very much close linked. We don't have time to go into details. If you have any doubts about what is above, what is below, in the Hellenistic time, in Dendera, there is such a thing, for instance, in, I don't have a picture of it, in Knossos, they recently discovered some of the other sanctuaries around the main palace. And in one of the sanctuaries, they discovered there is a yeah, little space, you know, this, this typical pillar, crypt, arrangement in the middle, and the ceiling is blue with dots on it. So that obviously is a sky. Now we have a better example of it, one of the best is in Egypt, a place called Dendera, and in Dendera is the whole, whole zodiac already on the ceiling, rated down to the ground. That's what it looks like in detail. Now here you can see that this particular element, the, 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 the tree, the human figure, and, and then, then pillar becomes differentiated, as you see, at the entry, that's entry into the sanctuary of soul, which has head differentiated from the body of the column and the base. And it stands in the entry into a sanctuary, the building. And it can represent the building as a whole. Because it represents the human figure, the human figure, the deity, and the deity of course, the overall order of the place. Fair enough. That's why we can then understand how this very mysterious and full of, you know, mental debates from Mycenae, again, Mycenae on, on, on Peloponnesus, the very famous Lion Gate. The pillar in the middle, which represents practically the sanctuary, represents, of course, the citadel as a whole, and it's surrounded by those lions. And so okay, so we have principles of columns. And the trinity, the division, is absolutely crucial. That's what the columns would be doing. The mediating name between what is above and what is below, that would be articulated then to friezes and problems as well. And then the base would be also elaborated and much more uh, differentiated you know, as a uh, you know, base of the column. Now, another one, very quick. How the cosmic conditions? I'm selecting, obviously, out of thousands of possibilities just to bring it home. Uh, how does it burn? How did the natural condition come to architecture? Charter. Probably a number of you have been there. And you know that the main thing is what is inside. The architecture is interesting, sophisticated, etc. But the real, what is it all about and what is it for? This whole complex construction is about 
the interior light that comes in and is transformed through the windows and creates this sort of very magic uh, continuum of color light which brings the meaning from the iconography of the window into the space itself. Fine. So it's about the movement of sound. The window which is referred to is the Vespa sound. It's like a you know, gate to a city, if it is, travel large. But the window is referred to wrongly rather than the empty town. Rosetta window, it's not even Rosetta, it looks like it, but doesn't mean anything. It is a cosmic, it's a, it's a, this is a sound window, it's a sound, a movement of sound, like the zodiac. It has 12 <coughs> stops, it goes around in circle, 12 stops, which are eventually related to 12 apostles, and the 12 apostles is the center, which is Christ, is the key to all that. But the window means more than we see on the surface from outside, that's from close. That would contribute to, you know, how the world is created, with a perfect circle, blah, blah, blah. Now, be interested in that. This Vespa sound is dedicated to the movement of sound and the whole current cosmic cycle, just in the ground piece. Right? Underneath are two major scenes. One of them is the uh, pedigree of Christianity, which is the tree of Jesse back to Old Testament, and then um, crucifixion. And <coughs> basically what the window is, is bringing to visibility the mystery of the phenomenon and mystery of life and death, life, death, and resurrection. Now, this is there on the wall. What happens now is that it's tuned to the movement of real, real, like and real sun. The sun goes around the cathedral. And that's why anybody who knows about it would recommend you to be there at least in intervals through the day from 10 to afternoon to evening because otherwise you don't appreciate what's going on. The themes and the meaning of the eastern part is related to the sunrise. The sunrise travels through the lunch in the middle of the day towards the end and then there's a sunset. And the sunset is of course coinciding with the death, that's the end. But sunset is already promised of the beginning because the sun comes back again in the morning. So it's a cycle. And the cycle is of course, as it were, brought to life, animated, and as it were, uh, brought to full meaning in relation to the concrete natural phenomena, which is in this case, the light of the real sun that moves around. Okay, let's go across. And here you can just barely, barely appreciate, you know, what happens in the different part of the church as the light moves around. What comes out of it in the end, and I can only touch on it, this is a different cathedral, <coughs> different cathedral but it's in principle true for practically all cathedrals, that all cathedrals were about. It was about creating the conditions, a certain conditions for the manifestation coming to visibility of light which eventually creates a space. <coughs> it's not about the window, it's not about the ribs and pillars and walls. There are all means that help the thing to come to visibility. <coughs> the real thing is the simultaneity <coughs> of the inside, the continuum space of the situation as a whole, which in one way, without further explanation, unfortunately, can be described as the luminosity of the space, the luminosity of the piece of architecture, the luminosity of the world, which comes to visibility in cathedrals. In this case, okay. Uh, I have no time to go much into detail, but just to show you, the Middle Ages ended up in understanding that all that we're talking about, the movement of light and the luminosity as a phenomenon, can be grasped through optics. So the optics was highly developed discipline taught at all universities and so on. And you can see the light comes from sun eventually, okay, so travels down, and it hits halfway down the moon. That was the distinction between celestial and terrestrial, heaven and earth. Moon. Everything which is above the moon belongs to the heaven, below belongs to the earth. Once it passes that, it starts picking up the density of earth. earth. So it goes from fire to air to 
water, and eventually to ice. Once it comes down, it ends up, in this case, in the eye of the spectator, the one who is sort of picking up the particular vision. And it's an interesting illustration which has not been commented properly yet about. If you want to know, it comes from a treatise, Vitruvius and Commentary on Vitruvius, literature called Latin, early Latin, and old Italian. Cesare Cesariano is the name of the architect, the secondary architect, but it comes from the group of people who were working in Milano at that time. It was published in Como, outside Milano, but uh, in Milano was a group of people who were responsible for this kind of thinking, transition from optics to modern perspective. Who was there? Leonardo, Bramante, and somebody called Luca Pacioli, who was primarily interested in perspective. Okay, enough, enough. Uh, I'm leaving that out. Uh, now, what we have to say, it's very, very important now, very briefly, uh, is that um, the natural conditions, if we go back in time before 1700, <coughs> the natural conditions were there as ultimate reference. That was the reference, ultimate to kind of foundation, the ground. <coughs> Obviously, history was above it. People did have history at least from the Greek 6th century, Herodotus and so on. And they, of course, had thinking, a bit of uh, philosophy, a bit of scientific speculation and so forth. So that was there. But what is happening around 1700 is that uh, the cosmology, the cosmological framework, the natural conditions, which were defi defined as cosmology, which means everything which is above and also below. Cosmology talks about stars, sun, moon, and so forth. It also talks about seasons, talks about plants and people and so on. So that you see there's a whole separate, that's cosmology. What happens in 17th century is that the clever people start looking first on what can be more explicitly discussed and preferably mathematically interpreted. So that, as it were, they didn't bother about the below, they just took the above. And the astronomy comes out of it instead of cosmology. So cosmology from 17th century is not cosmology. The term should not be used. It's leading. We don't have cosmology today. All we have is astronomy and astrophysics and <coughs> celestial mechanics. That's what we have. That's the truth. We don't have cosmology. That's not the case. People still refer to, you know, cosmology, future, whatever, expanding cosmos and all those. The transition is interesting in the period of 16th century where the cosmic references would be still taken as the ultimate reference. And yet, this study begins to take over. This is a painting from early 16th century by Aldorfer, German painter, who paints the battle of Alexander the Great and his victory over Darius, the Persian king. The Persian king is defeated and is death of the army. So he's the death of the Persians. And look at that. The battle is there as a historical interpretation, historical representation. And yet, half of the painting is not about that history. It's about something else. It's about what you see here, <coughs> the sunset. As we saw it in Chartre. The Chartre, <coughs> the sunset has reference to death, the end of things, and so on. So, it's not by coincidence. He does not need it. I mean, we don't have any evidence that something of that sort would happen in the battle of Alexandra. He brings the whole, almost like a moon or a cosmic, very neutral, broadly oriented landscape into the painting. And how it is mysterious, moon kind of landscape, is this dramatic, over dramatic sunset that culminates the interpretation of the battle, of the death, death of the Persian Empire. This illustrates the transition from cosmology to the historical way of thinking in culture, but in architecture in particular. I would like to say one thing which is very crucial, and that's, some of you may be interested, some of them, some of you not, but the kind of <coughs> talk that we still uh, listen today, today, that architecture depends on what? Harmony, symmetry, proportions, you know, all that sort of stuff. After 1700, from 1800, 18th century onwards, is total 
clutch, a waste of time. It's misled. It has no meaning outside the cosmic framework. It has a meaning only in the cosmic framework. The business of proportion <coughs> is part of the cosmic configuration, and architecture participates in it, which means, you know, what is there is here, therefore I can take from the cosmic context principles of organization, structuring, and ultimate order, and bring it into my buildings. But if I don't have a cosmos, <coughs> the meaning is gone, there's no framework for it. And that's why from 18th century, listening to that stuff, harmony of the spheres, the music of the sphere, and the relation between musical harmonies and visual harmonies, and palladio, the full still of that sort of analogical thinking, says, you know, my buildings are just like uh, polyphony of uh, the sounds because of the proportion, the proportionality of my rooms in my villas have something to do with Monteverdi and those people doing music, Zalino and so on. Maybe uh, that's 16th century, 17th century, not anymore. The cosmos is gone. And you can see it here you know, that the interest is now astrophysical, astronomical, astrophysical, and basically celestial mechanics. So those are images that speak about the human systems. And the system is, of course, the terms that we use here. What comes out of it? Talk about not anymore principles that are cosmic, but principles that have their legitimacy or give legitimacy to our design principle because the legitimacy of origins. If it has a definable origins, I can justify my birth. It starts with <coughs> Solomonic Temple, Tuscan Temple, Etruscan Temple. You can go on. It culminates and begins to be almost like a dogma, even today. Architects, unfortunately, still refer to it as being the source of architectural principles. And I'm just thinking, there's the unfortunate notion of primitive heart, Logier, somewhere in the middle of the 18th century. Primitive heart. Then you see, you know, the nature comes down. So you are in the level of history. What is interesting, a small comment, that the people moving away from the cosmic natural conditions into historical conditions and framework means that nature is itself absorbed in history and becomes a historical discipline. Now, I'm not going to talk about it, but think about what on earth is meant in London when you come next to VNA Museum. It's a museum of nature, but it's called Museum of Natural History, isn't it? How does the history comes into it? Now, history is nature. But also nature can be seen as history. That's exactly what has happened, very briefly. Solomon Temple, some of the reconstruction. Now, the first acceptance that we don't dream with cosmos, and we cannot derive our principles from cosmic, as it were, symmetries, harmonies, etc., etc., is a recognition that we deal with temporal, historically determined principles, which can be only grasped and understood as it were genetically, as we go through genesis, historical development. The first explicit acknowledgement of that, and you can see that's the beginning of architectural historical thinking, and not cosmic thinking anymore, is Fischer von Erla, <coughs> architect from Vienna, Baroque architect in Vienna, who wrote a big treatise based entirely on those genealogical steps, steps towards his own time late 17th, early 18th century. Now, he goes, the first five books or six are about, believe it or not, the seven wonders of the world. Then he goes to the ancient civilization. He picks up China. He picks up Islam, Egypt, and so on. And then he goes to Rome, Greece, and Rome, and from Rome directly to his own time, and his own buildings are based on that historical sequence. So they are historically determined. The legitimacy, why you do it a particular way, doesn't come from conversation about proportions and harmonies, but comes out of the conversation about what is the legitimate origin of your things. Very quickly, this is Mont Athos. The Dinocrates architect promised Alexander the Great that he's going to make the Athos mountain into his monument. Egypt, Colossus of Athos, Paros, Lighthouse, Mecca, Palmyra, Forum of Trajan, reconstructions of the Domus Aurea, 
and that is buildings. <coughs> it's buildings. That's a project for a chamber, the Chateau, which is like, you know, Versailles for Paris, Chamberon is for Vienna. It's massive, it's huge, and it's structured and kind as of a sequence of historical periods. It starts from the oldest empire, and the oldest empire, people you believe at the time, was the Persian Empire, which means a series of kingdoms put together into an empire. And therefore, the entry, you go through the entry to columns, and you have this Persian tent, the king, and the polo, there's a ritual of initiation, is taking place in front of it. Then he goes into Jerusalem historically and culminates up there. It's bigger than Versailles. And the scale of it, you can see that in front of it, the Cordonnaire, this oval operation, is that. That's the reconstruction, area reconstruction, of Naumachia, which is a lake in the gardens of the Emperor of Nero, in his domes area. And it's a lake on which you play uh, games on ships, Naumachia. Now, this has been destroyed after Nero died. And on its place, exactly on those foundations, is sitting now Colosseum. So the Roman Colosseum size tells you how big is that upper part, just the good on air. And on the both ends, he's got just as a kind of little footnote, uh, Palladio, the uh, two, two Palladia, Palladia, Palladia villas. All right. Now, the mentality, the modern mentality is developing. The problem here is that the uh, next stage, the stage of historical thinking in architecture, uh, the historical thinking, unlike the cosmic reference, the cosmic principle, because the valve is one, and it's come on, your shape, there's only one reference. There's only one sun, there's one moon, planets are visible by everybody from Arabia to uh, Ireland and so on. So, History is not the same. History is not one. There are many histories. So suddenly relativity. And that what brings architectural thinking towards 19th century and, and late 18th and the 19th century to this dismal situation where you know it's not very clear, should it be Gothic revival, should it be the revival, you know, what do you choose? I got my history, you got your history. I believe in Roman, you believe in Christian, and so on and so forth. The relativity was felt very strongly that people tried to compensate by searching for a new kind of objectivity. And that happens around the French Revolution. Rationalize the whole problem. Rationalize history and the natural conditions together into something which would substitute the relativity achieved at that time. This is a drawing, quite big, by Boulay, and it's referred to as a temple of reason. When you open it, the temple of reason looks like that. The upper part looks pretty reasonable. From the lower one, definitely not. The grotto, full of stones, mess. The detail on that, on the top of that grotto, is a figure of the mother Ares, the goddess of Ares. That's what it looks like. That's what it refers to as Tibet. Anyway, the French Revolution also went even further. What you see here, what it illustrates is that the reason and nature come together so much that we practically substitute not only history but also the natural condition just by our reasoning. We can reason ourselves. We are sufficiently together. We come in close to that stage of memory. Now it's memory and genius that actually comes into memory. Now the French Revolution, that's interesting. The French Revolution eventually in the therapy closed all churches, <coughs> religion, and it was substituted by the cult of the highest deity. The highest deity was not named. He wasn't God anymore. But it was high, obviously, reason. The reason. So, this is an example of the reconstruction. Some very important architects will be taking part in the transformation. This one is a plan for the transformation of the cathedral in Strasbourg into the temple of reason. Now you can see the altar is gone, everything is behind the theater. And there is a middle piece which is substituted of the altar in the middle of the theoretical arrangement. <coughs> Suppose that you ask the design in that kind of space, temple of reason, the piece that brings it together into visibility, like equivalent of the altar 
what would you do? You probably would do, I don't know, get on it. Now, what they did is look like that. That's the reason. So the natural reason is one. We bring it together now, and they are self-sufficient. Now, that brings us to a very critical state. The history becomes so problematic that it's almost unbearably arbitrary. And we are really moving into the 19th century that cannot be taken as a whole as to take it piece after piece after piece. You know, why the inspiration of Gothic and Gothic revival, right? That you can spend a lot of time on it. Each of them is kind of interesting small history, but they are already part of the future modern fragmentation. So there is no overall premise. The overall, overall framework is, you know, maybe a reference to something which may be still considered to be reasonable. People definitely from them are trying to find some new objectivity. Disciple of Boulain was a man called Jean-Louis Nicolas Durand, 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 D-U-R-A-N-D, -D, Durand. He was the first professor of a newly established school, the first split of architecture and engineering in terms of institution. There's a new school established in 1806 eventually in Paris called Ecole Polytechnique. That's where all the future polytechnics across Europe would have their origin. It's a school for engineers, and the engineering school trains all the architects. They believe that engineers are also possible architects. So Jerome is the first professor of geometry and eventually architecture. What he does with his students, he himself, and they just watch it. With his students, he makes a selection. But the history is just so now relative, <coughs> relativistic, to make a sense out of it. He takes the history as it were into perspective, which is look at it, the field, material. He himself, <coughs> self point himself, and make a selection of the most important building in the history of architecture. Can you believe that? Is there anybody in the room who can do that? I can't. Tell you so. You know, how do you know what is most important? You, who are you? Anyway, he does that. Not only that, but it's also the time that the school, Echo Polytechnic, begins to teach this modern mode of representation that we use still today of descriptive geometry, the coordinated plan sections and elevation. So the students draw all the buildings. You can see samples of that. You can get some idea what is there. Um, Amino Cathedral, Sharpe Cathedral, uh, Islamic buildings, and so on, Greek building. Anyway, they draw all the buildings selected in plan section of it on millimeter paper. The measures are precise. Now that's the first stage. And that's really the treatise called Reke Parallel Architecture to the Modern. He produces a second one because once he has that and the survey, comparative material, the table in the studio, <coughs> goes in and selects again himself with the help of you know, maybe if you can student, he selects all the important elements that makes architecture architecture. Now what is it? Walls, windows, staircases, you name it. And that selection it believes to be sufficient to produce any kind of building that needs to be built. <coughs> that is a volume after volume, big piece, book after book in big piece. And um, by the way, this would be then the kind of document that every student in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts would have it on a test. And in our time, you may not believe it, even people like um, Leopold and that crew of people, you know, now, 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 classicists, they would live still on their own, believing that you can really bring architecture down to almost like a Lego. You can see uh, the ambition. You can build anything, anything, anything in that design. It is from that time that we have in our education across the board, across the world, in many places, School of Architecture still teach a discipline that is called elements of architecture. And even more important, of course, which is considered to be in some schools the key subject for studying architecture, which is called architectural composition, composition of architecture. So the composition and elements are, of course, is asked still today. From then on, 
becomes all these attempts to continue building up, mostly in 20th century, into a level of uh, design methodology, the business of methodology, to its origin here. The 19th century then opens, you know, understandably, an issue which is put into a book by you know, less known, but you know, generally the general heaps. heaps. For in what style should be built? In what style should be built? 1840, as late as 1843, uh, on the initiation of Shinto, Renze from Munich, and clever people like philosophers of that time, Shelley was a part of it, they asked the Maximilian, the king of Bavaria, to open a competition for the invention of a new style. Because we're living in an age of invention, and so much can be invented, why not architecture, style? So that illustrates the mentality we are touching on. Poor Shinko, his dream was this. This is one project just to show. Um, it's a mausoleum of the Queen Charlotte. That's what he would like to build. That was his project. Because, because of the pressure, because of the contemporary humanists and his umbo and people like that, they pushed him into that, so that's how it ended up. But you know, the relativity of history and the possibility of theoretical thinking, there's no better way to describe now that state that we move away from history, history is over. We're moving into theoretical thinking. Now, the theoretical thinking means integral positions, and integral position means very much the internet the dream life about. And we are back to square one and we started to, you know, very first conversation. There is a split horizontal and split vertical. We are somewhere in the middle. Uh, the horizontal split is a split between the fragments of the mainstream, what is expected, and that is a split between the uh, <coughs> construct, again mainstream, and our personal intentions. Now, we're looking at stuff that we know. I'll just give you a few illustrations. We know where we are. We are always the inside of the bow area. Interesting per se, if you don't know where you are, if you don't know there is a museum, that sooner or later you should be seeing some paintings and sculptures and so on. And that, you know, architecture should not be substitute for the content of the museum. Nevertheless, we are in the realm of particular dreams and visions, individual dreams. This is a 1942, during the war, drawings, not just Phantasmagoria, but drawings that he intended to be, after the war, real potential projects for concert halls, etc. And it's Hans Sharoum. And as you probably know, well, you certainly know that Sharoum eventually succeeded in the 50s building the famous Berlin Philharmonie. So we are living in the sort of world of high tech, but also we're living back in the sort of world of very intimate reflection on not just history, but also natural conditions. It's interesting that Sharoum, when it comes to building the Philharmonie, in his report, in his comments, he refers to it in following words. He says, I was building this palace. When I saw it coming together, it was for me, like a valley, with vineyards on the slopes. And altogether, I saw it like being all situated somewhere in the big tent. So those are the kind of key images, you know, all like melodies in music, putting together in their composition. Now, what he says is, of course, everything depends on one's imagination and man's imagination is all that matters in architecture. So the most intimate introverted. Next to it, not very far, as you probably know, is Mies, the National Gallery. And Mies, among other things, says, people, sorry, people are not what interest me. What interest me is the sheer beauty of the mystery structure. Where well, it's quite actually pointed, you know, it's a, an interesting point is that this, as you probably know, is in the West Valley, just close to the wall. On the right hand side, you have, you know, you're looking from above the National Gallery, it means 
on the left hand side is Sharul. And in the middle is a space which has never been resolved. Many competitions and it's still empty and used as a car park. And it's called Kultur Forum, the Forum of Culture. It somehow summarizes the dilemma of the 20th century. That's where we are. And when it comes to slightly more demanding tasks like you know, cities, but the fragment is not terribly helpful because we deal with something we share as common. I'm not going to do that. That is the man. It just illustrates, you know, the distance and so on, and the virtuality. Designing a housing scheme based on the mechanism of the block. We don't need that. We don't need that. Parametrics, fine. But we don't have to, as you were, spend much time on that. You are familiar with it, and there's been another lecture altogether. But I would like to show a, a this example which illustrates one, one interesting problem. We put everything together, we said so far, we are definitely in the level of theoretical culture. Everybody's got his own theoretical position, individual theory. theory. Zaha has theory, Renku has a theory, and so it goes, so it goes. And the result is a theory. The buildings are theoretical buildings in many, many, more than one way. Now, the important thing is just to pause and see what is really at stake here, what is really happening. The national conditions have been substituted by historical as a mainstream. The history from 18th century onwards eventually substituted by theoretical positions, that's where we are. But, but, the nature hasn't disappeared, it's still here, the natural <coughs> conditions are here, history hasn't disappeared, it's still here, it's still living in traditions and sequence of history. How about what you're doing is historically determined our language and customs, blah, blah, blah. And so what happens is now that we're looking, as we are vertically down from the theoretical position back on the history, occasionally, but we're looking at it from theoretical positions. There is a theory of history that we see. And we also see nature as a theory of nature. That's why recently in schools of architecture, such a uh, fascination with natural forms. I remember as a student the Darcy Thompson imitations of natural forms, spirals and snails and all that. We used to take it as a joke. And now, Students are looking at it, reading it, left and right. So, return to, so that is theory of nature, the, the nature itself. And yet, the true nature is here, and the true history is here too. But that's exactly what it is to us, the lot and world. Because occasionally, we succeed to open the door and move into really historical sequences and precedents for our buildings, genuine tradition and German continuity of references, and occasionally even to the natural conditions. I don't go into national names, but, you know, I would certainly like to mention people like, uh, like, uh, I don't know, Chipperfield maybe, a few younger people in this country, uh, and uh, certainly other Caesar in Portugal and so on. Very subtle, and you have to know what you're looking at. Occasionally, because the intention is certainly that there is a now, not always, but in some buildings. So then we obviously have a different conversation. It's happening. It's happening as opening the door to the latter, against the conventional. The conventional is the superstar dome, brand architecture, or the infinite commercial boardroom that you find in you know, downtown America and Europe. Put that aside, opening of the door, and I'm using just one example to finish. Eric Pani, in a terribly unenviable place. You don't know, you know if anything can be done in a place like that. We are in stock. Stop it. That's what I'm trying to say. Stop it. Stop it park. It's just outside. I, I, it's outside this one. It's a science park. Now, what can you do in a science park? Roger Bacon, sorry, Roger Bacon. Ro Richard, which is next door. And uh, you know, so it goes, so it goes. Um, Eric Parry is trying to kind of see how you can open the door here. So what he's doing is the left part of the building 
He aligns with the road and the excess, so that's the topography of the place. The right of it, he aligns with the lake, which is in front of you. Luckily, he's got this water there. And the middle is not only entry, but also part of the foyer. And basically, the half of the building is a hole. Foyer, this archery of soil. That's what he looks like. Now, there are a number of things which take place there. So let's look at the drawing. If the drawing in the middle section, so it may go through the middle, what is there is that inside the building, right underneath the staircase, is a pillar from which water comes out as a spring. And the water travels into a channel that goes along, it's not visible here, but it goes sort of diagonally. What you do see on top of there is above the channel is a skyline. And then the channel travels you know, brings the water out into the lake, which is outside, into this little bridge across. Then it comes to the waterfall and ends up in the lake. So the water sort of communicates between the building and the lake, but not only that, it also communicates vertically. It communicates between the channel of water, the skyline, which practically goes exactly about, precisely the same dimensions as well. So the light coming from above travels down into the water reflected there. But in between the light and the water, which belong together by you know, certain sources of communication, is mediated by a wall deliberately emphasized as a kind of mediating surface out of light, grayish, marble, that pick up the configuration of light that comes out of the sky and brings it down to the level of water. You see part of it there. You can see the wall as it comes to the outside, the diagonal. What you don't see, of course, is the channel of water because that's what uh, the client eventually didn't want to have. But you see the skyline that travels across and so on. There are a number of other things, but very important thing also, of course, is you know, here is the fragment of the wall and looking back into the foyer. The upper floor, the offices, are designed as wall that is made practically out of uh, uh, glass brick, glass block, that creates a kind of distributed light, very much sort of distributed, equal, almost light. And on the height of the table, just above the horizon of the table on which you work, is a horizontal window that goes around, and that picks up the horizon of the landscape. And the landscape, as a horizon, builds up into the horizon of the window so that it is the horizon of the floor ceiling and rest of the building. And it's quite powerful, it's very like a dream. So you get this sort of communications. You are obviously at the beginning of a process and asking for some possibilities, how to open the door. Number of examples, and I can obviously bring probably another lecture sometime in the future, uh, trying to illustrate more the already achieved and already existing successful attempts to keep opening the door. Those are some projects. Down in Cambridge. And I think that's about where we stop. It may be, again, arrangement, that uh, we have about two or three minutes of experience. Is there any, any interesting provocative question? Don't hesitate to ask. <coughs> Anything, anything that comes to your mind. 